hey, it's me, walking through a rich neighborhood in Oslo and talking to a camera. You should try it, great fun. Over the summer, I had an uh, internship with a large technology consultancy firm. We, that is myself and two other interns, we, we worked on a project with the Norwegian rail authorities and we tried to predict uh, train delays. And because this was a paid internship, and because now that I have been paid to do machine learning, I feel uh, obligated to uh, call myself a machine teacher. I worked as a science teacher before, teaching uh, kids to do science. And uh, teaching machines was a wholly different experience. I found that the machines complained way less. Now, in order to celebrate my newfound rule over the domain of machine learning, I'm going to talk about it. Not how I rule, but about machine learning, that is. All right, first I will try to define what machine learning is through a uh, historical narrative. And uh, second, I will uh, compare machine learning methods to more traditional statistical methods uh, in order to illustrate what I consider some weaknesses with machine learning methods when you apply them incorrectly. And lastly, I will speak most likely at great length about YouTube. So stay tuned. <laughs> It is difficult to give a completely rigorous account of how machine learning came into being in the short time dictated by the average attention span of a regular YouTube watcher. Nevertheless, I will provide you with uh, what I consider the notable milestones in how machine learning uh, was developed. Machine learning has kind of spun off from the larger field of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence uh, first became an academic discipline back in the 1950s when the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence assembled leading researchers in related fields, including Marvin Minsky, John Nash, and Claude Shannon, all superstars in their own right. The aim of this summer school was to explore ideas based on the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And here you went about living your life thinking that machine learning was something new. Fool! The first attempt to replicate or model the brain happened actually long before the 1950s. Uh, already in 1943, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts, they uh, tried to simulate the entire brain. Quite unsuccessfully, I might add, but they, uh, in the process they defined what is today called a threshold logic unit. A threshold logic unit is one of the first mathematical models of a neuron. Not long after, psychologist Daniel Hebb proposed what today is referred to as Hebb's law. Often summarized as neurons that fire together, wire together. And it was these ideas that gave rise to modern artificial neural network models. First known by the much cooler name, in my opinion, multi-layer perceptrons. Arguably the first learning computer was programmed in 1959 when IBM computer scientist uh, Arthur L. Samuel taught a machine to play checkers. Samuel was also the first to use the term machine learning. A very precise definition of machine learning arises already at this time. It's defined as follows. The use of statistical techniques in order to give a computer capability of learning. And learning in uh, this uh, sense was defined as a progressive improvement in performance for a given uh, task. And it's important to point out that this learning process is aided by data and that the computer is not explicitly programmed to perform the given task beforehand. My favorite examples that illustrates this way of learning very well is uh, MarIO. The computer is given nothing but what is on the screen as inputs and it is also provided which button it can push. 
and the performance of the machine is measured with a fitness function. It increases in value the farther to the right Mario uh, gets. Uh, that's how you win the game. Get far farthest to the right. Mar IO employs a combination of artificial neural networks and an evolutionary algorithm called Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies, or NEAT for short. Change of topic, change of scene. Nowadays, the hype surrounding machine learning is very much real and strong. Therefore, I think it is very important to be aware of drawbacks of machine learning methods uh, for making predictions compared with uh, more traditional statistical methods. And when I say traditional, I do not mean old and bad. Both types of methods, they have their uh, benefits and uh, drawbacks, which I will try to outline now. So, in traditional statistical tools, where the most common method is, is uh, probably a regression analysis, you are mainly concerned with causality. So, such methods try to uncover to what extent some variable x causes variable y. And uh, it does this by estimating a mathematical relationship between the two variables. So explanatory power and causality are the most important things and you also are concerned with statistical significance. A machine learning method, on the other hand, is almost exclusively concerned with the precision in its predictions. And this sounds very good, but you are almost completely ignoring any rules governing the variables in the process. So an artificial neural network, for instance, is by and large a black box. I will try to illustrate what I mean with an example because things might have gotten a little technical as of now. In exhibit number one we see a univariate, there's only one variable, linear regression model, where the logarithm of the number of bank branches is regressed against inflation for 129 economies. The number of bank branches is used to predict the inflation in the economy. Hold on, crossing the street now. Think I'm good. Oh no, there's a car. Where was I? The number of bank branches may or may not be a predictor for inflations. The figure seems to indicate uh, that it has something to do with it. On the other hand, both inflation and the number of bank branches in an economy may be correlated with some other unknown variables. And this is a very important point, that correlation and causality is absolutely not the same thing. Conducting such a regression usually provides you with the coefficient for the explanatory variable, in this case the number of bank branches. And this is where you have the mathematical relationship I mentioned uh, earlier between the explanatory variable and the variable you're trying to explain how much of the variation in variable x can be said to cause variation in variable y. Now on to exhibit number two. Here we see a machine learning method, more specifically a convolutional neural network in conjunction with a support vector machine. Ooh, big fancy words. So as you, as you can probably gather, the model is supposed to recognize pedestrians on a street. In this kind of model, you ignore completely why the model comes to the conclusion that it does, that there is a pedestrian within the rectangle, the box. The only thing that you care about is that the model picks up every single pedestrian, that it sees all of them, so that the self-driving double-decker bus you see in the background of the picture, uh, for sake of argument, does not run over the Beatles before they are able to record Abbey Road. It is the amazing prediction that this kind of model that make machine learning seem like some sort of magic 
and is probably the reason why people are going crazy about these kinds of models. And this may not always be a very good idea. So say you wanted to use a machine learning model to predict inflation. You could put all or any economic data into the model and probably have a good predictor for inflation, but it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to uncover the cause of the inflation, which is what a monetary policymaker like a central bank would be very concerned about. So consider yourself warned. All right, long topic. I think I need some coffee. <laughs> This would not be a proper rant about machine learning on YouTube if I did not talk a little bit about YouTube's algorithm. Several things go on artificially intelligently and perhaps unintelligently on YouTube. First and foremost, YouTube has a very sophisticated recommender system. In general, what such a recommender system does is predicting the rating that a user would give a certain item in the system. In YouTube's case, an item would be a video, while the rating given to a video is the watch time. In other words, YouTube's recommender system tries to predict watch time on a certain video given a certain watcher or user. When it comes to the recommender system, YouTube has been quite open and transparent, actually, without really giving away too many business secrets. The information that follows is taken mostly from an article published by uh, three researchers at uh, YouTube in 2016. I will link to the article in the description below. I find it very interesting that I found something like this because several YouTubers have voiced their concerns on how secretive YouTube is. Of course, YouTube cannot share all of its business secrets, but one of the conclusions I came to when researching for the, this video was that they uh, have actually shared tons more than I initially thought. So, the overall structure of the recommender system is comprised of two deep and wide neural, artificial neural networks. In the first one of these models, Please see this figure for illustrative purposes. We have what we will call the candidate generation network, where a few million videos are first sampled from all the videos on YouTube, which uh, is called the video corpus. This set of videos is narrowed down using user data and context data. User data is data about the user and the user watch history. And context data is data about where the user is, what time of day, the year, what platform the user is in, and uh, so on. And this smaller set of videos is called candidate videos and are videos that are intended to be generally relevant to the user. In other words, the candidate generation neural network performs a rather rough and superficial selection where a selection of uh, a few million videos is narrowed down to a few hundred. Now, next step in the recommender system is the ranking step where a second neural network is allowed to do its thing. We can call this network the ranking network because this is where uh, the models, uh, the videos are actually ranked. They are ranked by using user history and context uh, data and here you also have optional other sources of videos. Say a certain user is likely to watch a video after watching another initial seed video. So the role of the ranking network is also to use impression data to calibrate candidate predictions for a particular user interface. For example, a user may watch a video with high probability generally, but can be deemed unlikely to click on a specific homepage impression due to the choice of thumbnail image. And such factors are tuned using live A and B testing. A and B testing is quite common for tuning deployed and live machine learning models. A and B testing in YouTube's uh, case is conducted by showing very similar users recommendations with slightly altered content. This is part of the experimentation that people had very huge problems with uh, a few uh, months back. So one may show a tiny sample of users auto-generated thumbnail pictures for instance. This kind of uh, A and B testing is nothing new. YouTube has been doing this at least 
since a few years prior to 2010, probably much longer. Another very interesting finding that I've done is that ranking by click-through rate, as uh, YouTube calls clickbait, often promotes deceptive videos that the users do not finish watching. And I found it interesting that YouTube, by and large, do not like clickbait and try to avoid optimizing its recommendations by it. At least that's what they say. So back to the ranking network. It's important to note that during the ranking process, a lot more features of the videos are analyzed than in the prior candidate generation process. Remember our model? This includes, but is not limited to, image recognition both applied to certain frames of the video itself and to the thumbnail as well as natural language processing of audio track in the video and the metadata connected to the video like description and title and so forth. And the goal is first and foremost to present a list of the best recommendations to the user. This is accomplished by assigning a score to each video according to, in YouTube's own words, a desired object function using a rich set of features describing the video and user. The highest scoring videos can then be presented to the user ranked by their score. This is a lot to take in but generally what YouTube tries to do is which videos is a particular user most likely to watch and watch as much as possible of. The set of videos now go from a few hundred output by the candidate generation network to a few dozen. The literature that I have been studying do not say anything about any criteria that may exclude videos entirely or give any example of content that can vastly reduce a video's score. But I believe that certain things do exist. I have not been able, regrettably, to gather much information on what kind of parameters YouTube employs to classify videos as non-monetizable. However, I don't think it would be too far from the truth to conjecture that videos are tagged in some manner during the ranking process that I just described. What they have probably done is to have humans watch millions and billions Did he just say billions and millions? of videos and have them tag the videos manually. And they probably don't have many people on the payroll for this, as this tagging happens for free whenever you as a user report a video and this data is then used to train a neural network or some other machine learning model and i think this is built into the ranking that goes towards the users or watchers the youtuber nerd city has made a very good video dedicated to youtube's secret codes where he tells the tale of how the swedish researcher silo found certain tags in the form of numbers added to some videos on YouTube. This could stem from reporting manual and manual review, automatic classification by algorithm, or both. As the YouTube researchers state themselves in the article that I found online, YouTube is not very fond of clickbait, but YouTube is very fond of watch time. At first, this seems like a good preference to have, but what happened? Specifically, I think of the rise of the strange toy and children channels on YouTube. These have like 100 million freaking views. This effect or phenomenon is not very strange when you think about it. Uh, like Rhett from A Good Mythical Morning said on the H3 podcast. It's, kids, the way they listen to music is they'll put one song on and they'll listen to it 40, 40 times in a row. Observe children watching YouTube videos and they watch, they, they get Which, into by the way, I, we go, your, and they'll watch the same thing over and over is again. Is your theory that there's people re-watching videos and it's fudging? the numbers. Well, I think definitely that's part of it. Indeed. I will end it here with a Chinese proverb. Be careful what you wish for. You may end up getting it. This was uh, my first foray into instructive scripted videos and I sincerely hope you liked it and I would implore you to consider subscribing. Thank you. Take care.